Hi, I'd like to talk about my uh, part of my woodworking journey, and this involved the uh, the box making component of the uh, of the journey. Muffin asked uh, how I began woodworking, and it's through box making. And this was, this was over a, about a seven or eight year period from 1995 through 2002, 2003. This is how I began. I had very few. Uh, tools at the time, very little machinery, and when I began I only really had a bandsaw, so and I'll talk about that in a moment. But I chronicle most of my uh, my journey in my book, as uh, one of my first books, From High Tech to Low Tech, A Woodworker's Journey, and I talk about that aspect of my, uh, my woodworking, the box making uh, journey, and how I began, and how I began to become excited about woodworking through box making. And I hope, hopefully, uh, this will inspire others to uh, to follow that same path through box making. It's quite exciting. It doesn't take too too long to create boxes uh, once you're set up and everything, and you have some knowledge on uh, joinery and how to create the boxes. So I'll uh, talk about the very first boxes I've ever created, and uh, this would be these would be bandsaw boxes. So these are two rough examples, not finished. They're bandsaw boxes from uh, possibly close to 30 years ago, maybe 30 years ago. They're not finished and they were strictly created on a bandsaw. And if you're familiar with bandsaw boxes, there's almost no joinery involved. Aside from uh, carving out the, uh, the components on a bandsaw and re-gluing them afterwards. So this is all shaped and, and created on, strictly on a bandsaw without any joinery. It's just gluing all the components afterwards after I've hogged the uh, middle portion out. And you can use, uh, there's not much wood involved and it's pretty exciting and people are always drawn to this type of box because it's, it's so aesthetically uh, pleasing. And uh, but here's, uh, these are mixed woods. These, this, I uh, forget the woods, but, but this is possibly cherry with, uh, with another contrasting wood. Another almost finished box of the same genre, the same bandsaw box. And this is a, uh, a finished box. One of my last remaining finished boxes. Some coins in there. <laughs> the coins actually date from that era, from that period. So that's interesting. So, so that's, that's how I began. And that's how I began to get excited about creating boxes. And, uh, and I wanted to uh, learn uh, woodworking through box making at the time. I wanted to understand joinery and everything. So, so this is how I began with their more organic uh, bandsaw boxes without any joinery and then I progressed to uh, more conventional boxes and here's an example. Now these are uh, music boxes that I created using uh, an assortment of exotic woods. They're fairly straightforward with a chain to hold the, <laughs> with the uh, lid open and it had a singular uh, one drawer and it was all fabricated with components all together with uh, very little pointer, actually just a rabbited bottom and the inside had a second layer at the very bottom and, and a tray to hold the tray up. Now the, uh, there is a music box component to this and I'm not going to fire up the music component because it will just overtake the whole talk here and I have three, three of these at the moment leftover boxes from 30 years ago or so and this, uh, I'll play them all afterwards. And this is, uh, the uh, joinery was, was interesting because I was, I was learning uh, dovetails at the time and this is, uh, it's an interesting joint. It's, it involves, uh, at the time it was an anchor jig and all the joinery, all the dovetails were created on uh, the rudder based joinery on a, on a, on a special Incra uh, joint tech. It began with Incra but moved over to joint tech at the time. It was quite popular in IP1 joinery so this uh, this is a corner that's actually dovetailed into the, uh, the sides the back and it's, uh, it's very interesting. I was very excited at the time because I had very little experience with this type of joinery but it was so uh, it wasn't that difficult to create with the, the jig. The, uh, <coughs> the beginning was an incorrect jig and then progressed to a joint tech jig was much more rugged and, and I'll actually put a picture up of that. Well, that's, how I, that's how we began to create more uh, conventional square boxes or rectangular boxes and the, uh, the music component was interesting and I had a small market for this at the time. There's another version. By the way, this is a uh, maple, maple uh, case with a lacewood top. 
and it's all kind of aesthetically correct with some uh, profiled edges. Smooth things over, and this is more of a bird's eye maple. I was very drawn to bird, bird's eye maple in that period, which was interesting. So I used a lot of bird's eye maple, and I have quite a considerable amount of bird's eye maple left over from from that period that I have never used again. So this is a little more interesting. I don't have the chain installed, but the drawer is larger. Again, it's uh, two level. There's a compartment at the bottom, and this is a uh, well, it doesn't really slide. But it's a walnut drawer. Fits in, so you can access two levels with the music music component. Again, with that same joinery and bird's eye top, maple, and walnut uh, dovetail corners. Again, using that technique I just described, using the uh, the beginning the the joint tech at this point. I was fully fully uh, invested in the joint tech system. It was much more rugged and much more precise, and it's quite quite a system even to this day. I'm surprised it isn't more popular. So these are, uh, that's how, these are the beginnings of my box making. So I started to market this at uh, local craft shows, this type of box, and it was fairly successful. And I, uh, again, I was always wanting to be challenged with, uh, with learning new techniques. I had to progress to something more, uh, more interesting, larger. So I moved over to, uh, to jewelry boxes. I found jewelry boxes were much more exciting to create. I could literally develop more techniques and more levels. So I uh, began with a two-level jewelry box and then a three-level jewelry box. And uh, I'll just put this back in the tray. And this is a sort of a, an aside. This is a, a more whimsical type box. Again, it's a music box, but it's uh, done with Spanish cedar. You can see one of the, uh, the features of Spanish cedar very very nice aroma of the wood but it does emit this uh, sort of a sap or something but aside from that it's a, it's a lace uh, sorry a bird's eye top and uh, Spanish cedar throughout An interesting box with back mounted uh, hinges just to make it simpler but and now uh, going back to these but these are fairly straightforward hinges they're uh, Low cost hinges and they're just mortised in on one end on the on the case side. Now I uh, progressed from uh, from that to my. I'm just showing you my one of my first larger boxes. I'll just move these over. My first larger boxes is this box with a. It has an inset lid, and what I mean by inset is it's actually uh, attached with two pins on either side and it's inset. With uh, in a rabbited, uh, a rabbited uh, groove, and it has this opening, and it was quite interesting at the time. So I was able to practice more, more conventional joinery, and not so much dovetails, but uh, miter joinery, which is almost uh, the de facto type of joinery for larger boxes. So I used uh, miter joinery to reinforce it. I used some pins, which are actually dowels, colored dowels, uh, both the back and the front, and. Uh, and this was a single level, and I use it for, uh, for my scrap wood now, my offcuts. That's one of my earlier ones. Moving up again, scaling up my work from smaller boxes to larger boxes. And this is a cherry box with a walnut top. So that, that was interesting. And that, uh, in the rabbit at the bottom with, uh, with a 3 16 or a quarter inch piece of uh, ply, if I'm not mistaken. Through this box, I, I began to explore and understand uh, the joinery a little more for larger boxes. So that was interesting. And then I, uh, <clears throat> just moving along, I, uh, I progressed to more <clears throat> elaborate, complex uh, boxes. And here's an example of a, uh, even the finishes were different. My earlier finishes were, uh, were uh, polyurethane or something, and then I progressed to spray lacquers. And this is a more the next level up. This was my one of my first forays into multi-level boxes. So this is a three-level box and it's actually purple heart with an inlay. So I did introduce all sorts of elements to uh, again to develop techniques and understand box making a little more. So the uh, the joinery is, uh, is, is mitered in the corners but they're reinforced using a, a slip tenon in each of the corners so it's right through. 
and that was uh, I had to understand how to do that and develop jigs for that. That was interesting. And then it's um, the hinging is uh, conventional here, but it does have a quadrant hinge to keep it from from the back from going back. A contrasting handle, a shaped handle that I developed. I used this uh, this style throughout my more recent boxes from that era, and then I also had an insert inside, and it eventually developed into a a uh, an engraved brass plate for the client. So this was my my foray into uh, into box my more advanced box making, and I began to market this these boxes online because this was a. Uh, on the cusp of the internet, the advent of the internet, which was interesting. So I was actually making some headway with sales. So the contrasting handle, the joinery was again mitered, reinforced miters. It's, it's a 30 year old box and it's held up since. This is one of my, uh, I, kept, I kept one of each just to, uh, for nostalgic reasons. And now I'll move on to uh, the next box. This is uh, another box in the same vein. This is a, uh, again, it's a three level box. I'll just flip this around. Again, it's mitered, reinforced, but this miter is almost the only way to conceal the actual joint with slip feathers or keys. And I either uh, use uh, contrasting or uh, more subdued slip feathers or keys to uh, either accentuate the fact that they're slip feathers or, or just uh, their more subtle appearance. And the hinges were, uh, conventional hinges, not super high-end hinges with a quadrant hinge, sliding drawers. This was uh, something I really featured in my uh, marketing, the fact that there's three levels in these boxes. So you have the two sliding drawers at the very top, the center, the middle drawer, and the bottom compartment. So you can actually access the bottom compartment by sliding the, uh, the drawers back and forth. Ball and you can divide them differently. And this had a raised lip and it's all cherry with a walnut with a walnut uh, handle. And uh, that would that would be that box. And uh, so again, wanting to improve my uh, my techniques and I was always looking seeking challenges in my work and, and trying to be uh, remain ahead of my competition at the time because I was actually marketing these boxes. Uh, on, a, on my, one of the early websites in the late 1990s. Here's an interesting box. It's one of the early uh, three-level boxes where I introduced a, a bottom drawer. So the, it's, a, it's a cherry box with a, with a lacewood uh, top, and the top is inset in a, in a groove, and it's floating. You have to understand it's, it's not finished at all. So I had developed some new techniques. I had uh, Reinforcement in the uh, in the miters, concealed reinforcement in the miters. So that was that was quite a challenge. And these are the actual uh, trays. They're not the carpets aren't finished at all. And I'll show you a version of this that's actually finished. Again, it's a three-level box. In this case, uh, two le two upper levels and then the drawer. And these are the uh, some of the components I used. So this is the handle. It was fairly standardized, and these are the, uh, the smaller dividers. So in this case, I probably used cherry to, uh, to contrast with the lighter wood. So I developed techniques and jigs to create these smaller components, and I usually spent a few days just creating the small components in, uh, in small batches. And the boxes themselves I would create in small batches. I create, I never create one at a time, I always create a few at a time. The batch has actually increased in size over the years because it's much more uh, viable and economically to create several boxes at a time when you're, when you're selling them. Now the interesting thing about this box is aside from the, uh, the bottom drawer, which was quite a, quite a challenge, quite a challenge to uh, incorporate into this, uh, everything changed, the whole game changed with the box making because of that bottom drawer. I had to create an opening and match the woods, match the front of the drawer with the rest of the box. And then the, uh, the interesting part is the, uh, the hinges were back mounted stop hinges. And this is probably the first time I've used them. And I had to develop some, uh, some uh, using their templates, specialized templates to actually mount them. Because uh, 
the boxes. The boxes are uh, created as a one unit, and then they're sawn open. All these, most of the later boxes, they're sawn open and then attached, cleaned up, and attached with the hinges. So I wanted to improve the technique of uh, so introducing back-mounted hinges, so you don't see the hinge. And also, also uh, it's an easier way to uh, to mount the hinge. It's cleaner and it's uh, installed on the back without any visible uh, hinge in the, within the, uh, the jewelry box itself. So I also created the humidors at the time. Humidors are essentially the same box with a different interior and I was a good market for that too. So uh, I had a full-fledged business creating these boxes and uh, so some of the samples I had left and you can see the, the top is still floating. <laughs> And that's the only way to do this, really, to have a floating top within a groove to keep it from tearing itself apart. So this was more a more advanced box at the time, and uh, talked, I did talk about the Purple Heart box, and I would not recommend using Purple Heart for a box making. I made a few of these, and I swore I'd never make them again. Purple Heart is an incredibly dense tropical wood, and it's hard to work with, and it's hard to get finished, and it splinters. And, so I moved away from that, and then I'll, uh, so I wanted to, uh, wanted to show you my, this is my most popular box, it's a mahogany box, again it's three level with a Wenge handle, with dividers, and the, uh, again the back mounted hinges, so I began to use uh, back mounted stop hinges exclusively, the uh, compartments were, uh, were larger, the boxes were a little larger and with larger compartments with dividers that were adjustable and then uh, the middle compartment in this case now you could either order this with uh, with three levels without the drawer or with the drawer with two two interior levels and the uh, and the drawer and uh, I should move this aside and everything was, he used to try to use match some woods, create contrasting woods and use a, build up the interior to, to a, involve a brass plaque that was customized for the client and he, that was a very positive feature at the time. So, uh, so that's this one, this one was probably my, my biggest seller, it's all mahogany with an inset frame and panel uh, top and it's floating again with, uh, so it has all the bells and whistles. Now this one happens to have slip feathers, but I did create them with uh, reinforcement within. Actually, it only has slip feathers at the top. I did reinforce the middle part, and that's uh, that goes way back on the technique I developed to do that. It's a slip tenon in, inside, and I'll put this aside. And I'll show you this. This box is probably at the peak of my box making, and it has almost everything. It even has a. Uh, I used. Uh, Banding throughout, at least with banding, it's mahogany with uh, wenge, wenge banding. Sorry, at least with lace wood, it's set uh, floating tops on both sides, and it has a lock. Again, it's a little larger than the last one. It has sliding compartments above, and it has a drawer at the very bottom. And uh, so this was a uh, with a contrasting interior with again the. Uh, engraved breastplate for the client. So this is uh, one of the remaining boxes I have of that era, but it's uh, it's uh, it's one of my most elaborate boxes and this was, I was actually marketing these for close to $800, $900 at the time. We're talking, oh, maybe 24 years ago, and I would probably that would probably correspond to about fifteen to sixteen hundred dollars today, but it did, it did take considerable time to create these, and I uh, had to develop techniques and uh, work in small batches. And uh, this one was a, sort of a one-off specific box. And these are the earlier templates I used for uh, for quadrant hinges. I forgot to mention. And uh, this is a handle, so I would route. So the earlier boxes were uh, were mostly created using. Uh, machines such as routers and all that with very little handwork, but the later ones they really progressed to using hand tools uh, maybe 20, year, 20 years ago. Well, this one didn't have the uh, back mounted hinges. It had a quadrant hinge and that works too. And it had this lock thing and this was, uh, if, any, if anybody's ever in installed a, a lock, a brass lock in a, in a jewelry box, it's pretty scary to create that mortise 
and have it done right and have it match with the opening for the key. Again with the banding, with the contrasting banding, it's quite an elaborate box. So that, sum, uh, that summarizes my, uh, my journey from, uh, from when I began woodworking through, uh, from bandsaw boxes through that uh, more elab most elaborate box and I constantly challenged myself. It was a very exciting time in my woodworking uh, journey or career and I began to market the box as they were successful and one thing led to another and I was creating boxes and batches and small batches and uh, it's quite an interesting period. But then of course I progressed to uh, furniture as I talk about in my From High Tech to Low Tech book. And I really, really wanted to move into creating furniture so I went back to furniture making school and studied uh, more uh, Krenov uh, based uh, techniques and the philosophy of furniture making and that's another episode for another day. But uh, the box making ended, I think, in 2002, 2003. And I was very satisfied with, uh, with the journey, but unfortunately it had to end. And I think I've made maybe a few boxes since on very, very custom orders for people. They're gone now, they're sold, but, but they're very similar to the most recent boxes you've seen. It was exciting, and uh, if you're uh, hoping to inspire people to like, follow that, path if you want to begin woodworking box making is a, a very good option it's exciting and uh, it's not as complex as creating furniture it's fewer parts smaller parts doesn't involve much wood and it's always uh, popular with uh, jewelry boxes are always popular and they will be in the future so and you could uh, learn several techniques through box making that apply to uh, furniture like you saw that three level box with the drawer I had to understand how to create drawers and adapt that to furniture making afterwards. Hopefully I've inspired a few people with this talk. And I did mention I was going to start my music boxes up early, so here I'll start one up now. That's one. There's another. I like how the musical movement uh, sound resonates through the wood and if you install the musical movement correctly it will, uh, the, the actual wood itself, if it's thin enough and if, it's, if the movement's installed in the right part of the box it will amplify the uh, sound considerably. You can see it, here's that first. The whole idea behind the, the musical movements, uh, they come in different uh, lyrics and different uh, notes and uh, they're amplified through the wood. They have different qualities of them, different uh, lower, lower level uh, musical movements or high end musical movements that, that will go on, play longer. Well, that was uh, fairly popular, especially the, uh, the early craft shows as I, I attended and had set up. And I will play them occasionally, uh, maybe annoying the uh, adjacent craftspeople, but, but it, will, it would draw people in. So it's something you keep in mind. Please subscribe to my channel and uh, follow me. As I, I'll talk about several aspects of my woodworking journey over the past 30 year period and, uh, and how, I, how I, uh, I became a furniture maker. And, I'll talk about different aspects, uh, highlight what I've talked about in my book. And if you want the book, it's available through Amazon or through my website, woodskills.com. And this, along with four other books, more recent books, this is probably one of my first books. Okay, well, thank you for watching.